do. I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Mr. Gary and uh, let him start start us off for tonight. Mr. Gary, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, bud. Uh, probably the first thing uh, I, I should do is give a little history of the Long Range Patrol and the Rangers in Vietnam. Uh, in 1965, uh, when, the, when the American involvement uh, uh, became more conventional, they got away from the advisors. Uh, the 101st Airborne Division's 1st Brigade was one of the first units to go over. General Westmoreland decided that we weren't fighting a conventional war at the time. We needed a reconnaissance uh, element to our military units that could go out and locate the guerrilla forces. The 1st Brigade, which was operating in, in, in two corps at the time around Benoit, he decided to, to form a uh, a, a provisional reconnaissance platoon uh, for First Brigade uh, that that started in July of '65. Uh, it was a volunteer unit. Uh, guys could volunteer from any of the 101st units to to go to this uh, to farm this pr provisional unit. Uh, we had truck drivers, uh, uh, infantrymen, uh, clerks, all volunteered to join this unit. Uh, it was tough getting in. You had to be physically able and, and uh, hopefully a background in that type of, of uh, service. When that unit was set up, uh, other units in Vietnam, 173rd Airborne Brigade, 25th Infantry Division, the Big Red One, uh, the 9th Infantry Division, also started farming provisional LERP units uh, consisting of volunteers. In the 101st, everybody was airborne qualified. It took about three months to set that to establish that unit. Just after the 101st set up theirs, the 173rd set up their unit. They were actually the first unit to pull a combat patrol. Um, I think that was in August of, of, uh, of uh, excuse me, it was September of uh, 65. Uh, the units performed various reconnaissance patrols uh, in, in two corps, in, in, in I corps, in three corps, um, no, 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 I shouldn't say I corps. Two corps and three corps and four corps is where they initially performed. I corps didn't come along till later when the 101st moved north. Um, the Marines had a force reconnaissance, uh, force recon, force battalion reconnaissance, which primarily did the same thing as the long range patrol companies, but they did it with eight man teams. Uh, the, the the Army used five- and six-man teams, and in some instances, they actually used four-man teams. The terrain dictated what type of, of patrolling went on. I know the, the uh, 9th Infantry Division, which patrolled in the Delta, very few of their missions lasted longer than a day, uh, mainly because of the terrain, the, the, the wetness, uh, the, the predominance of of civilians in the area. So most of their patrols were one day patrols uh, where they went out and, and mainly moved at night and hid during the day watching a village or something like that. Uh, there was a lot of misuse of the early LRRPs. Uh, they were used for things other than reconnaissance because the infantry units that they were assigned to uh, didn't know how to use LERPs, didn't know how to use long range patrollers. Uh, later on in the war, when when we, when the North Vietnamese Army started sending their forces south, uh, everything changed. It was no longer guerrillas that we were looking for, but NVA troops. Uh, they were in larger units. They moved a lot in the daytime. Uh, the long-range patrol teams actually started operating in six-man teams in most places and stayed out for anywhere from three to seven days on a mission. Changed everything in 60, 67. The LRRPs were the provisional units that operated early in the war. When the divisions uh, came to Vietnam, the full divisions, it went to LRP, Long Range Patrol, instead of Long Range Reconnaissance Patrolling. That happened mainly in 67 and lasted up to 1969 when all of, the, all of the LRP units were converted to Ranger companies. Uh, the mission didn't change that much during the uh, transition from LERPs to Rangers because it happened overnight. I was there in, in 68 uh, as an LRP, and in ja January 31st of 1969, all of the LRP units became Ranger companies overnight. 
Um, later on in the war, in 70, 71, when it was primarily NBA after 10 of 68, it was primarily NBA that we were fighting. And at that point in time, uh, uh, all of the Ranger companies took on other missions, uh, bomb damage assessment patrols, uh, rescue missions, uh, going in after down chopper pilots, uh, ambush missions, uh, trying to start a, a battle where the American forces could pour on uh, after after contact was made. Uh, these were the Ranger type missions that happened in 70, 71. And it was also the period where our type of unit suffered its, its heaviest casualties. Uh, the main difference between us and, and SOG, uh, Studies and Observation Groups, was primarily, they were primarily special forces and they operated with indigenous personnel. Uh, we very seldom went out with indigenous personnel. Usually if we did, it was a Kit Carson scout or maybe one or two people. Uh, our, our missions were always within South Vietnam. Uh, there were occasions we went into Cambodia or Laos, but it was unusual for us to do so. Um, uh, SOG teams uh, consistently, they, sometimes they ran 12-man uh, teams with nine indigenous and three Americans. Uh, they were almost always in Cambodia, South Vietnam, uh, North Vietnam, or Laos. Uh, that was the main difference in SOG. Their missions tended to be a little hairier than ours because they were usually confronted with larger enemy units, and they were across the border. Uh, it, was, it took longer to get re, uh, a reaction force or, or a helicopter uh, extraction for them. So it was much more dangerous what they did than what we did. Of course, dead is dead. Uh, I, I can't. I can't say they lost a lot of teams. They lost a lot of people. Uh, as far as I know, in Vietnam, we only lost two entire teams. The 101st lost an entire team, and the 25th Infantry Division lost an entire team. I'm not aware of any other LERP units that lost an entire team. Um, uh, we also operated sometimes in heavy teams, a 12-man team, where two teams would go out together, uh, usually because of the mission or because of the area was more dangerous than normal. Uh, I was on a patrol one time with a heavy team where we got surrounded by a couple of NBA companies, and it was pretty hairy getting out of there. We ended up losing uh, four killed, and everybody else on the, on the heavy team was wounded. That did happen on occasion. Uh, the, the bad thing about being alert, uh, if you got in a firefight, uh, you were almost always uh, surrounded. Uh, and, and outnumbered uh, by, by quite large numbers. So we either had to fight our way out, escape and evade, or we had to be rescued, or our reaction force had to come in and relieve us. Um, I was there at the height of the war, 68, 69. Uh, I was a volunteer, like, like most other guys that served in long-range patrol companies and ranger companies. Um, I, I was airborne qualified, as, as were most of the guys that came over with me. When I got there in, in summer of 68, the 101st Airborne Division was still an airborne unit. It changed shortly after that, uh, primarily because the 173rd had taken some heavy casualties, and most of the replacements coming over that were airborne qualified went to the 173rd. Uh, there wasn't enough people coming over with our qualification to keep the 101st uh, pure airborne. The 82nd had also sent a brigade over after 10 of 68, and they were all airborne, and they were also taking up new recruits coming over that were airborne qualified. So the 101st one, air, air, airborne, or air assault, I should say. Um, uh, let me, let me, I covered the history basically of the long range patrol and rangers. There were three three phases, LRP, LRP, and Rangers uh, that lasted throughout the war. When I decided to write my, my first two books, they were about my tour in Vietnam, Eyes of the Eagle and Eyes Behind the Lines. Uh, Black Berets and Painted Faces was the military book club hardback version of the, of the two books that I wrote. Uh, when I wrote them, I wrote them as a single book. But Ivy Books, who, who bought the rights to it, decided to bring it out in two paperbacks because it was too large uh, for a single paperback. Uh, Military Book Club, Club published the hardcover uh, combination of those two books. When, I, when the books came out, 
I, I wasn't even intending on writing books. I was, I went to my first reunion in 1986. And, and, uh, after that reunion, a lot of my memories came back, and my fiance, who became my wife, had saved all the letters that I had sent home. Uh, I didn't want to go to that first reunion in '86. I'd forgotten names, I'd forgotten people's faces, I'd put on weight, and I thought, I don't, I don't want to do this. She had asked me. She said, "Why don't you sit down and read all the letters I kept? It maybe it'll help your memory." So I did that the night before I left for the reunion. And it was like reading a diary. My letters were were day to day, and and told what missions I went on, and who was on the uh, team with me, and and the the basics of what happened on that patrol. When I came back from the reunion, I decided to to put all this in a diary format, so that my sons, I had four boys, that my sons could read what I went through in the war. Um, it took me about six months. I, I hand wrote it on 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 yellow legal uh, pads. And uh, a friend of mine, Ken Miller, who was a good buddy in Vietnam, had already published a book called Tiger the Lerp Dog, which was a, was a big hit. It was the first book about lerps. And even though it was a novel, it was, it was based a lot on fact. Uh, when I had finished my diary, Ken called me and said, uh, how's the book coming? I said, what book? I told him what I had done. He said, how about sending it to me? I said, Ken, it's on it's handwritten. He said, copy it and send it to me. So I copied it and I sent it to him. And he said, this is pretty good stuff. He said, I'm going to send it to a publisher friend of mine. And uh, he said, I said, well, I'm not even finished with it. He said, let me do that. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, just type up the best two chapters you've got and we'll send, I'll send that off. He said, you'll have plenty of time. He said, it normally takes him six months to read anything. He said, you'll have plenty of time to finish it. So I bought a used uh, Underwood typewriter and I, I typed up uh, uh, the November 20th and no November 4th uh, days. I had pretty hairy missions, 1968. And I sent that to Ken and, and he forwarded it to Owen Locke at Ivy Books. And uh, he, I think he sent it in on a Thursday. The following Tuesday, I get a phone call from Owen Locke. And uh, he says, uh, Gary Linder? I said, uh, yeah. He said, this is Owen Locke. And I didn't recognize the name. I, I said, who is this? And he said, Owen Locke. And I said, what do you want? And he said, uh, I'll buy your book. He said, send me the rest of it. And uh, I said, who is this? I said, Miller, is this you? I, I never, never realized it was a publisher. He said, this is Owen Locke at Ivy Books. He said, I read your two chapters. He said, I'll buy the book. He said, send me the rest of it. And when I finally realized who I was talking to, I said, look, I said, the rest of it's handwritten. Uh, that's the only two chapters I've got done. And he said, well, send me the handwritten part. So I packaged it up and I sent it off to him. And he called me back two weeks later and said, uh, we got a problem. He said, uh, there's too much here for a book. And I thought, well, that figures. And he said, uh, we'll make two books out of it. We'll, we'll bring it out in two books. So I signed the contract and published the two books and, uh, they, they came out uh, like six months apart, and I had a lot of phone calls from people wanting to know what the second half of my tour was about, and uh, I wasn't very, very happy that there was a big gap between the two books coming out, but that's the way they did it. Um, after the books were out for a while, Military Book Club uh, contacted Ivy and wanted to, to buy the rights to publish the hardcover version, which was Black Berets and Painted Faces. And Ivy gave or sold them 20,000, the right to publish 20,000 books, which sold very quickly. And Ivy wanted to, to do another 20,000, or excuse me, uh, Military Book Club wanted to do another 20,000 books. And Ivy felt it was competing with the paperbacks and they refused to do a second round. Uh, about a year after that, I was talking to Ken Miller and Ray Martinez, guys that had served uh, ahead of me. Uh, and we had decided to, to write the history of the 101st LERP Rangers in Vietnam. And since it was such a, a, a large and detailed history, we decided that each one of us would do a separate portion. So Ray Martinez, who served with 1st Brigade LERPs, would write the history of the 1st Brigade LERPs. I would do the, or Ken Miller would do the F Company, 58th Infantry LRPs. And I would do the final transition uh, of the L Company 75th Rangers for, for the 101st. Um, we wrote those books. They came out fairly close together. Uh, 
they got a lot of good reviews. And uh, when, when we finished that, I had guys from other Lerp Ranger companies contact me and say, how come nobody's writing our history? And it was, it was, a, it was a fair supposition. Uh, there were not, 13 Lerp Ranger companies in Vietnam. And uh, there, there was a book about Charlie Rangers uh, written by a couple of guys, but nothing really about the definitive study of all the Lerp Ranger companies. <clears throat> so I decided to do a series uh, where I would do one mission story on each of the Long Range Patrol, uh, LRRP, LRP, and, and Ranger companies in Vietnam, just so that they had somebody writing something about them. So I spent about six months interviewing uh, vets from different LERP Ranger companies, and, and I finally compiled two books about all of the LERP Ranger companies that served in Vietnam, which is the Phantom Warrior series, uh, books one and two. Uh, Ray Martinez and I and Miller, we call that that series about the 101st of the Six Silent Men series. And again, Ray wrote book one, Kim Miller wrote book two, and I wrote book three. Um, I was pushed to write other books. That was never my goal. I didn't want to become an author, a multi-book author in the first place. So I, what I did is I used my connections uh, with uh, uh, the publishers I had uh, to help other long range patrol guys and rangers get their books published. I think all in all, there was like 42 guys that I helped get their books published. And even a few outside the Lerp Ranger community. Uh, Richie Burns was a good friend of mine. He was a pathfinder in Vietnam. I helped him get his book published. Uh, there was a school teacher, a friend of mine, who was drafted at 26 years old, married with two kids who left a high school teaching job. I helped him get his book published. It was Classrooms to Claymores. I also encouraged two of our pilots, Wild Bill Meacham and uh, W.T. Grant, to get their books published. Um, they supported us. Matter of fact, most of us probably wouldn't be here if it weren't for them. And it was an honor to help them get their books published. Um, I, my brother, who was a journalist during the Vietnam War, served most of his time in, in Hawaii. Um, he, he approached me about doing a publication called uh, uh, Behind the Lines. We started out as a newspaper, a 36-page black and white newspaper. It went to a, a multicolored newspaper and finally to a, a green, white, and black magazine and finally to a full-color magazine. And we published that for five years. It was basically stories, behind the line stories, about special operations units. It was a bi-monthly publication. We ended up with about 25,000 subscribers. And we published it for five years until I had a heart attack and, and had to stop putting it out. Um, I think my, I still I still do some editing. And uh, I've just Ray Martinez and I just finished a book about David Dolby, uh, which uh, is Pen and Sword Books bought the rights to it, which will be coming out in about six or eight months about a Medal of Honor recipient from the first cab uh, who won the Medal of Honor at LZ English uh, and then ended up serving five more tours in special operations units after receiving the Medal of Honor. Um, I knew Dave Dolby. He's, he's, he passed away before the book came out, uh, but he was a good friend of mine. Ended up serving a tour with Charlie Company Rangers, and it was an honor to help Ray Martinez uh, I did the editing on the book. Ray wrote it, and uh, and again, Pen and Sword Books bought the rights to it. Uh, Ray uh, Ray was a good friend of, of Dave's also, and since Dave was a Charlie Company Ranger, it was a special honor for both of us to get that book published. Um, that's about all I can say about the Long Range Patrol Rangers. Uh, that's kind of our tradition. There were thirteen companies that served in Vietnam. Uh, some of them were provisional companies. Some of them were just platoons. Uh, some of them were full companies. Some of them were reinforced. Two of them were reinforced companies uh, that served with the first and second field force units. Uh, they were uh, commanded by majors, had 200 and something men in the company. Uh, we had 106 uh, allocated, except we hardly ever had that number. Uh, we usually ran up to eight teams uh, in our company at a time, which means we usually had two or three teams in the field at, at any given point in time. Uh, we didn't have enough helicopter support 
to have all eight teams out at, at one time. Uh, that was a dangerous situation if that happened. Uh, I remember, remember times where we had four or five teams in the field at one time, and that was dangerous enough. If one team got in contact, the other teams had to go dog and, and, and lay still uh, uh, while that one team was was reinforced or rescued. Um, I'll tell you, Bud, I'm, I'm open for questions anytime if anybody wants to ask any. Uh, 